Are there times when you feel lonely and abandoned, as if everyone has abandoned you with your challenges? Your friends, who could have helped, have rejected you, leaving you to bear the burdens of life alone. You may have even reached a point where you contemplate giving up on God and His promises. But cheer up, the burden bearer is here. God is always present, listening to all your heart's desires and prayers. I want to tell you that there is hope. Jesus opens His hands wide and says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11, 28-30 This message carries a deep spiritual and symbolic meaning. It is an invitation extended by Jesus to all those tired, worn out, and weighed down by the struggles and challenges of life. He offers them rest and relief from their burdens. He assures them that if they take all their troubles to God, they will find peace for their souls. A yoke is a wooden bar placed on the shoulders of two oxen to help them pull a heavy load together. But the yoke Jesus speaks of refers to the teachings and way of life that Jesus offers. By taking on this yoke, Jesus invites you to join Him in partnership and to learn from Him. The yoke symbolizes the kingdom, values, and way of life that Jesus represents. Furthermore, Jesus describes Himself as gentle and humble in heart. It portrays His compassionate and understanding nature, emphasizing that He is approachable and sympathetic toward those who seek Him. He assures you will find inner peace and spiritual rest for your soul by following and learning from Him. Unlike the burdensome and overwhelming yokes of the world, Jesus assures you that His yoke is easy and His burden is light. Embracing Him will give you freedom, ease, and fulfillment. The path Jesus offers is one of love, forgiveness, and spiritual nourishment, which ultimately leads to a lighter and more meaningful existence. By focusing your mind on Him, you will experience relief from the heaviness of life's challenges. Obedience to God's Word is all needed to bear His yoke. What are your heavy burdens? It could be guilt and regret from past sins, resulting in a heart heavy of condemnation. However, don't act like Judas, for Christ's blood has been shed for the remission of your sins. Faith in God presents the opportunity for forgiveness and redemption. God is willing to bear the weight of our sins. Direct your attention to Christ the Savior and the burden will be lifted. This is the purpose behind His death and resurrection. Allow God into your heart and witness how much lighter you will become. His Word is powerful and you must trust in its infallibility. Are you battling with a terminal ailment? Or have you been diagnosed with a health condition you least expected? The test result might have reduced your self-esteem and hope for a better life seems lost. Anxiety and worries may have become the new way of life, but God is saying come to Him. He demands that you trust in Him and take His rest in exchange for this burden and pain you carry. Or who else can help if not the one who created you? Beloved, at this point, it is crucial to place your faith and trust in God, the giver of life, joy, and happiness. He provides comfort and strength during times of physical pain or illness, offering hope for healing and divine intervention. Trusting in God's plan and surrendering your worries to Him can work wonders that you can never imagine because it's a deep act of faith. And faith in God can turn any situation around. When life gets tough, find solace in His presence. Keep your mind steadfast on Him. Seek His guidance and strength consistently, and you will find comfort and peace amidst life's struggles. At times, heavy burdens manifest as lack and financial hardship. The loss of a job or the search for a good one may be the greatest weight you bear. Trusting in God's provision and divine intervention is the way out. Though trusting God to alleviate your burdens may be difficult, it is the most rewarding choice you can make. Release the weight of worries and anxiety at the foot of the cross and let go. God will take care of it. When you become a child of God, you enter into a relationship with Him. While this brings numerous blessings and benefits, it does not shield you from the challenges and hardships of life. Being a child of God does not exempt you from experienced tribulations, such as physical illness, emotional struggles, financial difficulties, relationship problems, or persecution for your faith. Accepting Christ does not guarantee a smooth and trouble-free life. 
In fact, Jesus never promised us a life without storms. However, he did assure us of peace and victory. He said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. John 14, 27. In the midst of these trials, Jesus assures us of his peace. This peace comes from knowing that we have a loving and faithful God who is with us in every circumstance, providing comfort, strength, and guidance. Your desire now is to hold on to the assurance that God will make way for you, even in tribulations. He will provide solutions, open doors, grant wisdom, and comfort you. Your trust should be in His faithfulness and His promise to never leave or forsake you, not on your problem. Let there be a shift in your focus. You may not see God in all the different scenarios happening around your life, but that doesn't mean He is not there with you. You can only notice Him when you shift your focus from your problems to Him. The Apostle Paul endured significant hardships during his ministry, including persecution, imprisonment, and physical ailments. Prominent leaders challenged him. He said, But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15.57 Despite all the difficulties, he maintained an unwavering focus on God and stayed committed to spreading the gospel. The challenges didn't move him, Rather, he focused on God. Today, you can boldly say that Paul's letters, such as those to the Corinthians and Philippians, are part of the greatest Bible books on encouragement. That man turned his tribulations into a message of hope. Your challenges may persist because your focus is still on the difficulty instead of the deliverer. If you continuously dwell on the problems you face rather than shifting your gaze toward the one who can deliver, the obstacles may persist. Your focus should be on the healer and not your illness. Jesus promises rest to all who focus their attention on Him. Why not receive this rest? Why go through life in heaviness and misery when you have healing and lightness at your disposal? Don't you trust Him as the mighty deliverer? Don't you trust Him to help you? You need to trust fully in Him and He won't let you down. King David, the psalmist, experienced numerous trials and challenges throughout his life. He faced opposition from enemies, betrayal from close associates, and fear for his own life. He ran from place to place to ensure his safety. David consistently turned to God, pouring out his emotions and seeking God's guidance and strength. Instead of seeking revenge when he had the opportunity, he focused on the God of vengeance to fight for him. And indeed, the Lord avenged him of his enemies. Beloved, the three Hebrew men still maintained an unwavering faith in God even at the point of death. Daniel kept his mind on Christ while in the lion's den. No wonder he was so peaceful and unmoved. Joseph spent years locked up within the prison walls, but he never gave up on his dream because his heart was fixed on a God higher than his present circumstances. Beloved, God did come through for these men. He will come through for you too, but not until you fix your mind on Him. It's time to turn to God in prayer, seek His wisdom, trust in His sovereignty, and find solace in His presence. God is always faithful, even amid trials. Your limited understanding or small trust in Him does not make Him a small God. He can turn things around in a twinkle of an eye. In order to keep your attention on Christ, you need to develop a consistent prayer routine. Your communication with God should prioritize seeking His guidance and pouring out your heart rather than complaining about your problems. Never think you can bear the burdens of life alone. God wants you to seek Him daily and pray. Prayer also helps you understand God in different dimensions. It draws you closer to God in intimacy and sincerity. Let God's Word and promises inspire and guide you when life gets heavy. Study and meditate on the Word of God. Reading and reflecting on God's Word allows you to understand His teachings, power, and the nature of Christ. It provides spiritual nourishment and helps you align your thoughts with His. Remember, keeping your mind on Christ is a lifelong journey. It requires intentional effort and commitment. It is not a one-time task, but a continuous process. You must consciously prioritize Christ in your thoughts, actions, and decisions. Seek ways to align your life with the Word of God and you will experience divine encounters. 
However, it is important to be patient with yourself on this journey. It is natural to encounter challenges, distractions, and setbacks. It may take time to develop an unwavering faith in Christ. So persevere and remain steadfast in your commitment instead of becoming discouraged or giving up. Even when you can't see God in action, that doesn't mean He hasn't been working all along. Don't focus on understanding how He will do things. Rather, focus on His personality as the Almighty God. Relying on God's strength is crucial because staying focused on Christ cannot be achieved through mere desires. It requires leaning on God's power, grace, and support. By acknowledging your own limitations and relying on God's strength, you can overcome obstacles and steadfastly focus on Christ. Nothing is impossible for God to do, so don't lose faith because answers aren't coming. Keep praying and believing in His mighty delivering power. No mountain is impossible to move. No giant is unconquerable for him. Trust him and be ready for testimony. I expect to read your testimony in the comments section of the next video. When you ask for a helping hand, what do you mean? It means you are simply asking for the person's help. God's hand symbolizes his help, protection, and so much more. This hand is over your life because God is committed to helping you till the end. Believers are often tempted to believe they are in charge of their own lives. Many times they get carried away with their responsibilities that they do not know when to stop. They allow themselves to consume with the anxiety of what will become of their lives. They have forgotten that they did not make themselves. They seem not to realize that their lives are in God's hands he will do with it whatever he deems fit. Most times, believers need to be reminded that the driver's seat of their lives does not belong to them. They need to be told to step back and allow God to do his job. Your life is a project in God's hands. He started it. You were not there when the meeting was held in heaven, when God decided to create you and give you an assignment on earth. You shouldn't, Therefore, live as if you own your life and can do it all yourself. It is a common saying that those who leave everything in God's hands will see God's hands in everything. Have you left everything in God's hands? Or do you still carry every burden yourself? Let go and let God. Leave everything in God's hands to see your life going exactly how God wants it to. God's hand is there already waiting to take over the wheel. He is waiting to lead you to the place of destiny. At every point, he leaves you with the choice of choosing him or going your own way. Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. No one can keep a person alive when God decides it is over. No one can take another person's life when God still has something to do with that life. This should make you rejoice because you know that nothing can harm you with the hand of God over your life. Your life is hidden with Christ and God. No evil will befall you with God holding your life. The Word of God is infallible. His personality is unchanging. I want you to know that He will perform everything He has promised in His Word. So, like Isaiah 41.10 has said, do not fear. Do not allow the fear of anything or anyone in your heart. The hand of God will strengthen you. It will uphold you. His hand will also be there to help you every step of the way. When you believe that God's hand is over your life, you will also believe that you are not alone. Remember, His hands can't be separated from His being. Therefore, being confident that He is with you. His presence is fully hovering over you as His right hand is widely stretched over your life. Wahoo! What a glorious Father! Now, do you think any evil can befall you with God by your side? Do you think the storm can overwhelm you? Do you think the enemy can overpower you? None of these can ever happen to you because you are safe, protected, and secured in God's hands. The concluding part of that verse says, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 
When God holds you up with his righteous right hand, you will discover that you can also live in righteousness. Many people battle with so many addictions, which leads to their frustration and eventually them giving up on their faith. This is mainly because they have not come to an understanding of this verse. With God with you, you can overcome any habit. You can surmount any addiction. You can simply live the God kind of life. Ezra 7.28 says, And who has extended his good favor to me before the king and his advisors and all the king's powerful officials? Because the hand of the Lord my God was on me, I took courage and gathered leaders from Israel to go up with me. The hand of God gave Ezra the courage to attempt what seemed impossible. The hand of God is with you. Rise and do what you have thought you could not do. God's hands upon your life will make you enjoy favor wherever you go. You will come to the position where everything that had seemed impossible in the past will become possible. Psalm 145.16 says, You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The psalmist here acknowledges that at the opening of God's hands, the need of every living thing is satisfied. Now imagine that hand over your life. It means that all your needs are already taken care of. The desires of your heart will be granted by the hand of God. God can do beyond all you can ever ask or even think about. Rejoice in his hope. God's hand is over your life to heal you. During the earthly ministry of Jesus, the Bible uses phrases like, he touched him, he laid his hands on him, to describe the healing process of the people he healed. The power is still in his hands today. The good news is, that hand is on your life. That sickness buffeting you as an expiry date already, sickness cannot remain in your body with God's hand on your life. God's hands will transform your life. You will come from being defeated to becoming a champion when his hands pick you up. Activate the hand of God upon your life through prayers and total dependence on him. When you pray, believe that you will receive and have everything you say. Never entertain the fear from the enemy that you are alone, worthless, or have no future. His hand is there to help with whatever you face. His hand will bring you out of the dungeon, clean you up from every mess you have fallen into, and place you where you ought to be. The saints of old enjoyed the dividends of his hand upon their lives. His hand fought their battles, shielded them from evil, exempted them from calamity, and met their every need. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is not changed. He said that he is the Lord that changes not. The power in his hands is not changed. The abilities that come upon a man by virtue of his hand have not changed. Father, lay your hands on me. That's the prayer some believers pray. Though they are well-meaning, the prayer does not justify the ability of God. God is not just ready to lay his hand on you and take the hand away. His hand is always over your life, stretched out permanently. He wants to be in charge of the process and outcome of everything in your life. You need the hand of God in your life to be successful in business, ministry, and everything in life. You need the ability of God to work through you. The apostles had a successful ministry because God's hand was over their lives. God loves you no matter what your present predicament looks like. Do not allow what you are facing to make you doubt the ability of God. He can turn things around for you overnight. Your part to play in the equation is to keep trusting Him. Never reduce your confidence in Him. With God's hand over your life, lack becomes a thing of the past. All your needs are met. Your desires are taken care of and you will be marvelously fed. You will not lack any good thing. Everything you need to live a victorious life will be given to you. God's hand is the answer to all your prayers. You see, his hand is the source of his divine intervention in your life. With his hand, he is turning things from bad to good. Do you believe the hand of God is over your life? Have you been enjoying the dividends of having his hand over your life? Matthew 6.30 says, If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? I love it when I see scriptures like this. It simply melts my heart. 
and I can't get enough of God's special love for mankind. As much as God feeds the birds of the air and also takes care of the plants, there's never a part in the Bible that says those plants are in his hands. God keeps proving to us that he loves us beyond our imagination, and we know that we are his most valued creation. I would not want you to be confused about whether God loves you or not. He does. God did not create you and put you on earth to forget you. He is there with you. Many times in the Bible, he reiterates his willingness to help you in the scriptures with phrases like, I will help you, I will strengthen you, I will answer you, and I will supply all your needs. God means every word he says. He doesn't lie or say what he has no power to make happen. Believe in the word of God. Always remember that God's hand is over your life. When people experience breakthroughs or miracles, especially those beyond their imagination, they often say, I saw God's hand in my life. You might be wondering what this phrase means. It simply means that they experience God's ability, which is only possible through the agency of his hand. You will not be afraid when you know and believe that you are not alone and that God's hand is in your life. His hand is also over all your challenges and they are solved since there is nothing that is impossible for him. Cheer up, God will not leave you hanging. He loves you too much to abandon or give up on you. He will not forsake in you. He will ever make his presence known in your life, vindicate you and fight your battles. Be of good cheer. You are in safe hands because you are in God's hands. There is no reason for you to be afraid. With all the knowledge you now have about the divine protection of God available for you, face life with courage as Ezra did. Continue to believe that the hand of God over your life will make way for you where there seems to be no way. Luke 10, 17-19 The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan all like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. This took place after the sending out of the 72 at the beginning of this chapter of Luke. In the previous chapter, the 12 were sent out. Verse 1 of chapter 9 expressly says that Jesus gave them the authority to cast out demons, but for the 72, he did not give them the authority beforehand or expressly. However, the twelve, despite being given authority, had trouble casting out demons from a boy who was possessed while the seventy-two came back with good news about how they delivered people from bondages of evil spirits. We can assume that the twelve were the disciples of Jesus, but we don't know who the seventy-two were. In verse 3, Jesus tells them, Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. A lamb is the young one of a sheep and a sheep is a biblical symbol representing believers. Now the 72, the Bible says, were sent out as lambs. This means that they were not yet grown or mature spiritually. Perhaps they had just received salvation. They were not as experienced as the 12 might have been as regards matters of evangelism. But when they came back, they had good news. They had demons subject to them in the name of Jesus, and also power and authority to walk over snakes and scorpions. How does this apply to us? Most believers are living lives below the standard that God has set for them. They are not experiencing life in its fullness and abundance, which is what God wants for all of us. Some fail to reach their full potential in life. Others are doing jobs they don't like or staying in places they hate so they can afford a livelihood. Some are battling illnesses on their hospital beds, drawing nearer to their death daily. Some others are in large debt or going bankrupt. Why? because we as believers fail to put to use the authority that we have been given in Christ Jesus. We keep on asking, how am I going to do this? Well, we have authority in Christ. I don't know, but maybe there are those who don't know that they have God-given power. And just in case you don't, well, I am telling you right now. You have authority in Christ Jesus, God-given authority. Authority to walk through seemingly dangerous and dreary situations yet still come out safely. Authority to command things to happen in your life, and they do. Authority to declare healing, 
prosperity and a happy, successful day, and it happens. Jesus has given you that authority. The reason it may not be showing in your life could be that you do not put it to use. What does the Bible say? That whatever we ask in the name of Jesus will be done. John 14, 13 through 14. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. Even the 72 that were set out were not doing so through their own power. They did it in the name of Jesus, meaning that the authority we have is from Jesus, by Jesus, and through Jesus. Jesus has power, and he has delegated it to you. He has given you power over sickness, sin, demons, fear, and all manner of struggles that make our lives here on earth difficult. He has given you that power. You already possess it by virtue of being his follower, but until you take it up and exercise it, it will be a dormant power. Just like a tool that's been purchased and put in a store, it doesn't benefit anyone since all it does is gather dust in the store. The power that you have in Christ has to be put into activity by yourself. Jesus did his part by delegating it to you. And the part that is left is for you is to take it up by faith and exercise it. It is time to start putting to use the power that Jesus has given to you, to stand firm and resist Satan and all his agents and works in your life. You have that power to stand against him, and he for sure will flee. Ephesians 4.27 says, Neither give place to the devil. In chapter 6 of the same book, Paul describes the armor of God that we can put on as believers in order to stay protected from the attacks of the enemy. We are safe when we have that armor of God on us. However, he doesn't say that God will come and put the armor on us. No, God's only duty is to provide it, which he already has. Now our duty is to take up the armor and put it on. The subject of that whole part of scripture is you. You take up the armor of God. You make the promises of God active in your life by believing in them. You are the one who is supposed to flee from the enemy and evil. It is you who is supposed to take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, you stand. God has given you countless promises in the Bible. He has promised a life free of sorrow and sadness. In him, we can have everlasting joy that is not dependent on our prevailing circumstances. In him, we are healed of our illnesses. In him, we have the authority to cast out demons and uproot mountains and plant them in the seas. In him, we can also shape our lives how we want. This can only happen if we take up that authority and begin to live by it, and only if we make his promises real in our lives by owning them by faith. His word is there to back us up, but he won't do the activation for us. It is our responsibility to take up the power given to us by faith and use it to take control of our lives. We have the power and the authority to take the word of God, the name of Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit and run Satan out of our affairs. Command things into being and they will. We can stand our ground firmly against Satan, speak to him directly without always asking God to make him leave us alone, and he will definitely flee. Through Jesus you have power and authority over your entire life, your soul, body, and spirit. You have been born again, out of the Spirit of God and with the Spirit of God. This means that Jesus has passed his power to you. He has already done everything to secure this power for you, and he has given it to you. All that's left of you is to take up your position of power by faith. All you need is to stand on the ground where you rightfully belong. That's all that's required of you. The time to do that is now. Maybe for a long time the devil has troubled you because you didn't realize how much power you have over him. Maybe for long he has attacked you with all kinds of afflictions, poor health, broken family, loss of job, a troubled relationship, stress and anxiety about the future, etc. Now, however, you do know that you have power over Satan, that you have the authority to direct your life the way you want it to go, as long as it pleases God. You have the authority to eject Satan from the premises of your life because it's not his own to occupy. The time to claim that authority is now. The time to start living like the daughter or son of the King of Kings is now. Now is the time to end all your struggles. It is time for your restoration and uplifting in the name of Jesus. Like Jesus, you can tell Satan to get behind you, and he will. 
Tell him that his uninvited stay in your life is now over. He can't stay any longer because you have realized who you truly are in Christ. Tell him to go and he'll leave. Order him out because this is your life, the life of a child of God. Why would you be struggling with all this when your father has the solution to all things? Take up your position. Do life from a point of authority, not one of cowardice or fear. Be courageous in the Lord. The power of God is found in his word, and it becomes operative in our lives when we speak this word over our lives. Own it, talk it, and walk it. When we speak with authority over our lives and confess and decree the things we want and those we don't, the spiritual realms respond in the affirmative. Jesus, too, ministered and spoke from a point of authority. In his earthly ministry, he often said such things as, Be made whole, take up your bed and walk. Then to a lame man, Peter said in Acts 3, 6, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. It is time for you as a believer to portray the authority that you have received in Christ Jesus. It is time for you to become a living witness of the power of God in your life. Satan may try to convince you that you are powerless compared to him. He will try to make you forget that you are born again and that you have received divine power as your reward and inheritance. He wants you to stay oblivious to the authority you have in Jesus, because when you are aware of it and use it, you become absolutely dangerous to him. When you walk in the power that God has given you, nothing, not even Satan, can be a threat to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit of God will always remind us of our spiritual authority in Christ. As we do life, may we not be like people who have no power. Rather, may we demonstrate that we have been given authority by our Savior. As we preach the gospel of Christ, may we always have in mind that we have authority and dominion over everything that is not of Christ. It is time that we took up the authority that Christ gave us through his saving work on the cross. Nobody desires to be extremely tired and worn out. Weariness can set into your life even at moments when you least expect, and before you know it, you are all down. Everything in life becomes draining and disgusting. Nothing seems to work anymore. You have tried all you could to stay above the waters, but you find yourself sinking in every area. You finally get to the verge where you feel all used up. Then you start searching for renewal through movies, shopping, or endless time without friends. The irony of this step is that it leaves you more parched than you were before. It makes you stay up all night sighing and turning. You keep wondering when the wilderness experience will end. Sigh no more. The water of life is available to you for moments like these. We all know that water is very essential to the well-being of every living thing. Being hydrated keeps a person mentally alert. It aids productivity. It prevents some diseases and also prevents exhaustion. That is for the physical water we drink into our bodies. The same is also applicable to our spiritual life. As our body needs water to stay hydrated, so also do our souls need the water of life to stay alive. In fact, the water of life rejuvenates the weariness soul that has been caused by sin. When the living water constantly hydrates a man, vigor and strength are supplied to run the race. It removes fear and doubt, but instills courage, strength, and grace. To stay consistently refreshed and alive in the spirit, seek out the water of life today. Drink until your heart is filled. Drink until rivers of living water begin to flow out of your belly. Revelation 21, 6. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. In this verse, Jesus stated that he is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. When you get to a crossroad in your life, I hope you will remember this word. You may get to that point where you feel worn out and all your strength is gone. Hope slips out of your heart. You are worn out from the continuous battles in your life. When all these happen, I hope this word will echo in your mind that Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, the one who brought you this far and who will not leave you until he takes you to your glorious destiny. The concluding part of the verse says, He will give those who are thirsty the water of life freely. 
this is a promise from him to you. He has promised that when you become thirsty, he will give you water from the spring of the water of life. Jesus did not discriminate against anyone in his invitation. He did not say that if you are rich, come, or if you are a Jew, come. He said, as many as are thirsty, let him come to the fountain of life. He is not asking you to pay any price before you can drink the water of life. All he asks of you is for you to come. When you go to him, you have fulfilled your part. You will receive the water of life and drink till your soul is satisfied. John 7:37 says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Many passages in the Bible present Jesus as the water of life. His willingness to give everyone who would come to him the water to drink is also mentioned. He stood up on the last day of the feast and called out to everyone. This reveals that being thirsty is not necessarily something to crucify yourself about. I mean, when you are physically thirsty, you don't crucify yourself for feeling that way. You will go ahead to satisfy your thirst. This also means it's normal to feel drained and exhausted. It's okay to feel depleted and dry within. All your soul longs for at such a moment is a refreshing. That is why we long for relationships and things that will make our hearts renewed. However, all the efforts of man to satisfy the longings of the soul have proved abortive. They are all transient and not strong enough to fill the void in the heart. Jesus knew this and therefore calls out to everyone to come and drink the water of life. He, however, stresses that as many would come to him, they would receive a refreshing of their souls. The offer of Jesus still stands today. He is still calling out to everyone to come and drink the water that will make them satisfied eternally. Jesus met a Samaritan woman in Sakar. She was a perfect definition of a tired and hopeless person. She had been in five marriages, which all ended in shambles. The man she was living with at that time was not even her husband. She was a laughingstock in her community and was a negative example for others. She went to the well to seek satisfaction for her troubled soul. Glory be to God. She met Jesus, the water of life. Jesus overlooked her ridicule and reached out to her. He told her that if she should drink the water she had come to the well to draw, she would thirst again. This is synonymous with our efforts of filling our tired souls. We keep getting drained and always have to go back for more, but never satisfied. In fact, for many, this has become an addiction. Jesus pro-offered a solution to this long-standing problem of man. He stated that if we would drink the water he is offering, we would never thirst again. The water of life will satisfy our souls. That void that has been created as a result of the fall of Adam would be filled with the water of life. Then you will not have to seek after mundane things to get satisfaction anymore. Her encounter brought salvation to her and the entire city. That restoration of lost relationships renewed their souls from the thirsty state to being satisfied in Jesus. Jesus is reaching out to you today to refresh your heart. He will restore strength to you. He will give you the grace to run the race with new vigor. He will restore your passion. He will rekindle the fire in you. He will renew your vision. All these will happen only if you go to him for strength. He is there already, standing at the door and knocking. He wants you to request the water of life for your thirsty soul. The presence of water in a place makes sure life continues. You will remain alive when you have the water of life in you. Staying away from the fountain of the water of life for a long time is the easiest way to die. You can't afford to stay without the water of life in your soul. The water of life purges and cleanses. The water of life nourishes your soul and prevents spiritual death. It makes sure that you remain refreshed and up to date with your experience with God. The living water heals and comforts. It brings healing and deliverance. It brings breakthroughs and restoration. As beautiful and important as the water of life is to the soul, 
Jesus reserves it for those who are thirsty. Being thirsty is a sign that you need to drink and quench your thirst. Therefore, you need to thirst for the water of life. If you are still running after mundane things as a means of quenching your thirst, you will never get satisfied, and the water of life will not be given to you. In moments of depletion, don't turn to drugs or any external thing for strength. Those things will only make you more exhausted than you already are. Turn to Jesus, the living water, to restore your soul. Jesus emphasized the fact he is not forcing the water of life on you. He is offering it to you. You have the choice of either drinking or walking away from it. But I will encourage you to drink the water of life today. Life is already hard from the outside. Having to deal with an internal emptiness, exhaustion, and sadness is something too damning to deal with. So, do not overlook the offer of Jesus today. Come to him with your empty vessels, and he will fill you to overflowing until rivers of living water begin to flow out of your heart. Then you can also bring others to drink from him and quench their eternal thirst. Psalm 23, 2 and 3a says, He makes me lie down in green pasture. He leaves me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. The water of life is there for you to drink and be revived. You do not have to continue in dryness and leanness of soul. Accept the invitation of Jesus today. Go to him and he will refresh your soul. As you drink the water of life, your soul will be revived. Life will come into you again and you will receive strength as you have never had. When you believe in God, you will not find it difficult to go to him when your soul needs refreshing. You will always rest in his presence daily to restore your soul. You do not have to wait until you are completely depleted and no energy is left in you anymore before you reach out to Jesus. You can make reaching out to Jesus your daily practice. Always go to Jesus for daily renewal. Discouragement might set in your heart as a result of some failed attempts at getting a thing. That is the time for you to go to the fountain of life and drink from him. Some conditions might even lead to depression. You might have sought help from a counselor, but do not seem to get things together. Jesus is always ready to restore your soul. He leads you beside the still waters. The purpose of this act is to make you drink from that living water so that your soul will be renewed. The Bible says that those that hope in God will renew their strength. When your hope and trust are in the renewing power of God, you will be renewed. The youths shall faint and utterly fall, but because God has called and chosen you, he will provide constant and continuous renewal for you. He will renew your soul. He will restore strength to you. He told that woman that whosoever drinks the water he is offering will never thirst again. When you drink that water, don't veer off without coming back to drink more. You have to drink and keep drinking. And each time you drink, your soul is refreshed, your strength is renewed, and life comes fully into you again. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Bible says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Word of God is living and active. In other words, it works. The Bible is the Word of God. It is living. It has life. The moment that God inspired someone to write it, He gave His Word life. But we are supposed to make it active and working in our lives. We all have the responsibility of bringing into actualization whatever the Bible says. We're supposed to bring about the miraculous working of what God has said in the Bible. It's only you who can activate this Word of God. And if you don't, yes, it will be there. It will be in living existence, but in your life, it will be dormant. I don't want you to get confused by these two aspects of the Word of God. When God speaks it, He makes it living. When you speak it, you activate its power in your life. That's when it starts to work in your life. That is when it starts to act upon that situation. That is when the Word starts to give you that peace, that inner joy and comfort, that satisfaction in the Lord. 
And do you read the Word of God, believe it, and speak it over your life? It is simply like a dormant seed, like a seed without the right conditions for growth and reproduction. But when you believe it, personalize it to your situation, and speak it over your life, you place it in its most fertile ground, and it goes ahead to bear multiple and long-lasting fruit. What happens when you speak God's Word over your life is that it becomes active, it actualizes, and whatever God has said in the Bible about you and your life begins to make sense and begin to be a reality in your life. When you speak the Word of God over your life, you give it that power to go ahead and fight for you. You give it the authority to act on situations and on people to make them compliant with what the Lord says. When you speak the Word of God over your life, you begin to believe it. The promises made in the Bible become promises made to you and not just something written down in the Bible. There is power in the tongue. It might be a small part of the body, but it is one of the most powerful. It can cause chaos and it can also stop war. The tongue can put out raging fires and at the same time, it can light fierce fires as well. The tongue can curse and it can bless. It can bring relief and peace and it can cause anxiety too. It can break some relationships and build others. It's that powerful. So when you speak the Word of God over your life, you tap into this unfathomable power of the tongue. And in the best way possible, you tap into the power and authority that the words of your mouth possess. You bring into action the magnitude of effect that the words of your mouth can cause. When you say something over your life, it as as well as beginning to live it, to look like it, to behave like it. The tongue is that powerful. The words of your mouth are that powerful. That's why Jesus told his disciples that you shall speak to this mountain, tell it to be uprooted and to be planted into the sea, and it will do so. In Ezekiel chapter 37, the prophet of God only spoke to dry bones, and they acquired life. He only said words to them, and flesh came upon them, covered them, and the breath of life entered them, making them live again. That's the power of the Word of God when spoken over and into our lives. The whole universe was created by the Word. Not just words, but the Word from the mouth of God. He only said, let there be, and there was. Let there be light, and there was light. Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years, and let there be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And all these came to pass. The creation story continues, and we see how, just from His Word, God created a whole amazing universe with all its beauty and wonderful creation within it. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11 says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper the thing for which I sent it. The word of the Lord, what he has said in the Bible, will come to pass. But it won't become a reality in our lives if we don't believe it and speak it for ourselves. If we don't take it personally and own it, receive it as if it were just written for us. If we do not speak the Word of God over our lives, yes, it will come to pass, but it's just not in our lives. God says that His Word will never return to Him void. That means that at least one person is personalizing it in their lives. At least one person is making it happen in their lives. One person is providing it with the ground in which it can multiply and bear fruit. At least one person in the world is living it. And how I pray that you will be that person, that you will learn to speak the Word of God over your life, that you will learn how to counter challenges and difficult times with the Scriptures, that you'll begin to read the Bible and meditate on it as if you were the only target audience, that you will begin to source your strength, inspiration, and courage from what God says. I want you to start speaking the Word of God into your life, into your financial life, into your social life, your family, your academics, 
your health into every single aspect of your life. I want you to activate the wonder-working power of the Word of God. I want you to tap into His amazing power and glory and authority by beginning to own and actualize what He has said in the Bible. The Bible is your manual for day-to-day -day living. It's all you need. The Word of God has everything that you need to live a positive, righteous life every day that you wake up. When Jesus was tempted by Satan on the mountain after fasting for 40 days and nights, He overcame the temptation by speaking what was written in the Bible. Three times the devil tempted Jesus to sin, and three times Jesus overcame the temptation by quoting the Word of God and telling Satan what God says. Three times Jesus spoke to Satan, it is written, and Satan's schemes were defeated. Listen to his three responses. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Luke chapter four, verses four, eight, and 11. Afterwards, the Bible says that the devil left Jesus because he had been defeated by the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit as described in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. When you speak the Word of God over your life, you bring life into seemingly dead situations. John chapter 11, verses 43 and 44. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man came out. When Ezekiel prophesied over the dry bones, they gained life and became living again. When you speak over whatever circumstance in your life that seems to be dead right now using scripture, it will regain life. You can speak dead situations into life. You can restore health and friendship and finances. You can speak a job into existence and it will find you. You can command an illness out of your body and it will leave. You can order your evening today to be a certain way, and it will be so. Because the Word of God never returns void to Him. Just by quoting the scriptures, you can say this over your life. Cancer, leave this body, because by the wounds of Jesus, this child was healed. Stress is no longer my portion. I shall not be anxious about the future or be afraid of anything. I shall have peace of mind because God will give it to me, a peace that transcends human understanding. That is my portion from now onwards. Finances come into line because my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Devil, come out because you are overcome by the blood of the Lamb. You can use the Word of God to build your self-esteem and confidence by owning Psalms 113 verse 9. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. If only you could realize how much power you hold in your tongue. If only you could know how possible it is for you to turn things around. You'd transform your life forever. You'd begin to live differently and positively. You'd stop lamenting at how things are and start speaking them into how you want them to be. You'd stop living like a victim and start living as a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You'd start to live in the awesome reality of the Word of God in your life. God is faithful. His Word is true. It is powerful and it carries with it authority. It brings life out of death. It sheds light where there is darkness. It restores what has been lost. It casts out demons. It brings healing to the sick. It gives sight to the blind. The Word of God turns situations around and transforms people into the best version of themselves. You don't have to be rich or powerful or educated to transform your life. All you need is to speak the promises of God in your life. The Word of God spoken in faith in the name of Jesus has awesome power to overcome seemingly insurmountable obstacles. Romans chapter 10 verse 8. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That centurion in the Bible understood this. He asked Jesus to speak the word of God by faith and his servant would be healed. Peter understood this. In Acts chapter 9, verse 34, he spoke out, Aeneas, 
Jesus Christ heals you, condensing several healing scriptures into five words. And that is what happens when you speak the Word of God over your life. As humans, you may often feel like you do not deserve certain heights of achievements. You see these heights as too great for you to achieve. Hence, you don't even believe you can get them, not to talk of working towards or praying about them. Perhaps your present situation is far from the desired success and you feel like you did not have it, nor can God do it for you. Or you just do not want to accept that it could happen, since the realities of your circumstances do not match up with the vision. I've got a question for you. Why do you keep believing what God can do in your life? If you profess to be a Christian and believe in God Almighty, why do you still act as the unbelievers do? You call these people unbelievers because they have refused to believe in Jesus Christ, the Lord. They have refused to accept that He gave Himself for the remission of the sins of the whole world, and that His blood gave us access to numerous things. They also refuse to believe in any of His works. It's because of all this that they are called unbelievers. The question remains unanswered. Why are you, a believer, still caught up in this act of unbelievers? Why do you keep believing what God can do? Why are you denying yourself the realities of His power and blood? Do you not read in your Bible that He does wonders? Have you not heard that He performs miracles? Do you not know that He makes things possible in His own time and brings out possibilities from impossibilities? Or are you also of the belief that you must be deserving of everything that comes your way? That means that you only obtain whatsoever you work hard to deserve. If that is the case, you will miss out on everything God has in store for you. You will keep limiting His goodness. Have you not read about His miraculous works? How He parted the Red Sea, paving the way for Moses and the Israelites, and closing up the same sea on the Egyptians who tried to harm His people? How He made Mary, who knew no man, to conceive through the power of the Holy Ghost and gave birth to the Lord Jesus Christ? How He fed the Israelites in the wilderness and brought forth water from the rock? How He gave Abraham and Sarah Isaac in their old age, which scientifically is impossible? How He gave Samson extraordinary power that no man in his time could fathom? How He gave Solomon wisdom that surpassed the understanding of everyone in his time? None of them ever deserve it. It was simply God in action as a father over his children. He has done many things that you cannot even tell. He's still doing more miracles than ever, and many more wonders are yet to come. Perhaps you think that those were old testimonies and that the Lord can no longer do miracles like them. Remember the scripture that says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Hebrews 13, 8. Therefore, be assured that he changes not. He remains the same one he has been before the creation of the world till today, and he will forever remain the same. He also says in his word that you should cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7. His banner over you is love. He didn't create you to live in bondage or be subjugated to the status quo. He loves you beyond human comprehension. If he could make you, being the last creature, ahead over every other creature that he had made before you, then he's capable of lifting you above your wildest imagination in the twinkle of an eye. Psalms 34.10 NIV says, The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Unbelief makes you place limits on God's ability in your life. And when you do that, you are causing yourself to either be stagnant or drawn back. Unbelief is a disease that every Christian should avoid because it does no good. It only draws back God's grace over your life. Grace is about God being with a man to accompany and favor him in his dealings. Dearly beloved, why not avoid judging God from the lens of your situation? Why not hold on to Him fervently and believe in His words? He is able to do whatever He says He will do. He is not limited by circumstances, no matter how complicated they may seem. 
trust him and be positive. Hold on to his words today and do away with your lack of faith in him. Shun that voice that keeps saying to you that something is impossible, you don't deserve it, or how can it be? Rebuke it and say with God, all things are possible. Try this and see that the Lord is good. Hold on to him tightly and you will never regret doing so. His words are true forever. They are light to those who believe them, guiding their steps each day and leading them on the path of greatness. You should not be left out of this amazing grace. You deserve something good and great. God is willing to bring you out of the shadows of darkness. He is ready to bring you into eternal rest, providing all your needs and making you happy. If only you would believe in Him and not limit His work in your life. Strengthen your faith in God today. Believe that nothing is too big for Him to do and see Him work mysteriously in your life. God is amazing. We can never fully understand the extent of His greatness. He's bigger than the entire universe. He has no limits like us. Every one of us has an inner image of who we think we are and what we're capable of. Unfortunately, situations in life have done a good job of crushing our hopes and dreams. When this happens, we unconsciously set limits on ourselves. We believe we're not good enough to attract certain things in life and that we're never going to amount to anything significant. We allow our situations to define us, and by doing so, we place limits on what God can do for us. You could be thinking, can I really limit God? Oh, well, yes, yes you can. The Bible tells us of a group of people that limited Jesus in Matthew 13, 58, and their unbelief kept him from doing many mighty miracles in Nazareth. How you see yourself inwardly serves as a ceiling or limit to what you can achieve. If you see yourself as nothing special, you will not be anything special. God never created a failure. He made you in His own image, and His plans for you are greater than what you are currently experiencing. You were born to be great. Don't place a limit on God. If you do, not only will you suffer, but so will others. You have God-given abilities that are meant to bless others. Those people won't be blessed if you don't reach your full potential. We can also limit God's ability to work in our lives by trying to compare ourselves to others. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. 2 Corinthians 10, 12. Are you making a significant impact in the lives of your family, friends, church, and community? Will people come up to you in eternity to thank you for the way you touch their lives? If not, you can change that today by removing all limitations from God and believing Him for great things. Nothing can happen on the outside that hasn't first happened on the inside. You may be praying for the restoration of your marriage the healing of your body or financial prosperity, but you must meditate on the word to allow it to paint a picture on the inside of you. Your life today is as you've perceived it. You may not like it, but it's the truth. We often find great ease in blaming others in our lives. You don't understand. I'm limited because I lack the necessary education, or it's my marriage that limits me or it's my skin color that limits me. We have a million and one reasons, but none of these external things are controlling our lives. It's the way we think in our hearts that determines the direction that we're going. You must lift yourself up or you will sink to the bottom. I understand how difficult it is to keep swimming against the tides of life. Sometimes it seems just easier to take the easy way out and avoid making changes. But you must strive for something greater than yourself. Do something great with the life God has given you. Get out of the boat of limitations or you will perish with the others. I pray that God revives these values in your heart. He wants you to stop limiting Him. And when you stand before the Lord and He says, This is what I created you to do, all of your achievements will seem insignificant if you hadn't followed His instructions. 
The good news is that God is more eager than you are to reveal His plans and purposes for your life. The Lord desires to reveal His will for you, but in order to do so, you must first remove your limitations. Don't limit what you think God can do through you. Don't evaluate yourself on just your outward qualities. What God has placed in you by the Holy Spirit is beyond imagination. Don't set limits on God. What exactly do you want in life? What would truly make you feel like you're making a difference if there were no boundaries? Money wasn't an issue. Age didn't matter, and God had given you unlimited abilities. If you truly delight in the Lord, then your desire comes from Him. Take a risk. You won't get there in a single step. Take the first step toward that desire, then the next, and so on. You'll be a long way from where you are now and much closer to where God wants you to be very soon. Continue to move forward in faith. Continue to move confidently. Don't let your limitations get in the way of your success. Place your entire trust in God. Today, I'm encouraging you to stop limiting what God can do in your life. Give Him something to work with. He can only bless what you set your heart and hand to. Don't let your circumstances limit you. Don't let your past experiences stop you. God is making all things new. Remember, nothing is too difficult for our wonderful, powerful, and majestic God. 